<laughs> Sit down. Such a heathen. I'm Earl. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Earl. Hi everybody. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Don, for uh, last night as well as this morning. Uh, you got the gift, man. It's, uh, it's a great thing that you share with us the way that you do. It's inspiring. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to Yeah. And looking forward to celebrating your birthday with you tomorrow. We have to go on a watch tonight. We all got to, like, keep an eye on him now. <laughs> He's given us a glimpse of what goes on in there. We need to keep an eye on him. <laughs> so we can get him to that 25 and we can all breathe, breathe a little relief there, a little sigh of relief. Um, so, the, uh, what am I going to talk about? I was walking on the walking over here with a bunch of ne'er do wells, <laughs> and uh, they said, "What are you going to talk about?" And I said, "I don't know, you know, I don't know." And uh, I said, "What do you guys want me to talk about?" And uh, there were a couple of highly inappropriate suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> So I stopped asking those guys, and, uh, and uh, the people who ever listen to this are going to think, what the hell are those guys doing out in the woods there? Because when I said because the next thing was is that on the break after we listened to Don, um, I was uh, standing in the women's bathroom with Scott. <laughs> And uh, he, he just say, he said, you know, we got a lot, we got guys in the treatment centers, we got uh, a few guys, you know, and we got a few guys under 30 days. We got, you know, a good 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 slice of the community we have here this weekend are people that are new to the game. Um, and uh, Clark's here. Clark's got 53 days, right? And, uh, and I was talking to Clark, immediately following talking to Scott, and I thought, okay, uh, I know what I'm going to talk about for the newcomer. For the newcomer. Um, it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that ours is a code. Love and tolerance toward others is our code. Love and tolerance towards others. And i got to tell you, um, I had not given others a single thought. <laughs> for a long, 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 long time before I got here. And when exposed to the idea or some of the concepts that are afoot here, like getting out of self, out of self, service to others, these ideas were, were intriguing. As a faraway concept of something I might want to think about. <laughs> but the thought of actually doing something like this was completely foreign to me. I remained in... The, capsula the capsulization of my illness. I was self-centered and afraid when I got here. My tools for living had been taken from me. My tools for, livings, for living were drugs, alcohol, violence, and run. Those were my tools. And when I got here, I couldn't drink or use anymore. I couldn't fight. I didn't have another fight left in me. And I, I, I had nowhere to run. I had nowhere to run. This is the last house on the block. And what was I going to do? When knowing in my heart of hearts that I, 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 no more play, man, there was no more play in the rope. My way of doing things had been beaten to death. I had no way to be in the world, and I didn't know how to do the simplest of things. And my first thought that followed that was, and I can't let you know that. This, I can't let you know. I mean, if I told you, I knew when I was new, if I told you who I am, who I really am, if I told you the things that I've done, you'll ask me to leave because you look like reasonable people and that's what reasonable people would do. I was so ashamed. I suffered from a thing they refer to as survivor's guilt in that being in a plane crash and everybody dies but me. And I'm thinking I don't have a right to be alive. Forget, be happy, 
enjoy my life. I don't have a right to be here. I had such a self-loathing going on. I would wake up in the mirror and, and say things to myself that uh, have been suggested to me. We don't say here on this weekend. <laughs> There's no profanity here. But let's just say it was, I wasn't being nice to myself. I had a very low opinion of myself. There was a lot of hatred and self-loathing going on. And I'm sitting in the back of meetings hating myself and with the understanding that I've got somehow have to fight for my life at the same time. To feel like I don't have a right to be here, but be put in a position to have to fight for my life. It's a very strange conflict to find oneself in. And to feel that everything about my life, my society, my culture, uh, says that a man like me, I don't tell you the truth about how I'm feeling. When, you know, where I come from, men, we talk about our wallets and our genitals, you know, and we lie about both. <laughs> and to talk openly and honestly about my feelings as a man is a very foreign proposition. And to feel that, that, all the, that the code that I will come to follow is, is that uh, love and tolerance. And I love the fact that it's love and tolerance. It's like, man, they knew exactly who they were talking to, right? For the rest of the world, it's love. Love. Us, love and tolerance. Because <laughs> I'm so naturally intolerant of self and intolerant of others as a result. I... I can't cut anybody any slack. Everything, my mind works to separate me from you. You know, I'll be listening so that I can find some way to discount what you have to say, rather than try to find some way to connect to you. Let's find some way to go, okay, well, I, I, that, I love that. Let's hook up on that right there. Not me. That's not the way I function. So as a new person coming in, these ideas that get thrown around the world, around in the room, um, are incredibly threatening to somebody like me. It's not that even so much that they're, they're, they're foreign or I don't understand. That's threatening enough that you guys are talking about stuff that I don't get, I have no experience with, I don't know how to do this at all. To me, it's words coming out of your mouth. Some of them are hitting and sticking maybe, but some, most of them are just bouncing off me. I don't get this. That's threatening in the sense that if this is the last house on the block and my life is on the line about being here and I don't understand what you're talking about, I'm screwed. This is not, not going well immediately. <laughs> All right? I'm so afraid. And I have to do it in the company of others. Right? that I'm, I'm so isolated and now I'm going to have to connect on some level. It's all so foreign to me. So if you're new and you're thinking, you know, AA is nice and I'm glad they invited me to this little special gathering, but uh, <laughs> I'm just going to just sit back here and quietly devise a way to kill myself and several other people. <laughs> My thinking is perfect. <laughs> Good for you, you're right on track. <laughs> if every other thought in your head is, no. Perfect. It, few of us come in and go, uh-huh, uh-huh, great, well, lovely, yeah, yeah, I'm in, good, cool. You know? It's most of it, it's like, are you, ki are you kidding me? Are you kidding? I remember seeing a guy who'd never read uh, a how it works, and he got up at a meeting, and he was reading how it works, and he got to the ninth step, right? And he's just, re I mean, you can see he's reading it, and as he's reading, he's going, you know, and rarely have we seen a person, well, that's interesting, you know, constantly incapable, well, I hope that's not me, all right, all right. Long, he gets to the ninth step, and he says, you know, made direct demands, wherever, oh, have you seen this? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> right? It was just like, Hold it. <laughs> Completely understand. I fell on the floor. I thought that, I love that guy. And I mean, it's the thinking. It's, it's, you look, where you find our genius 
is you find our genius in those areas of our, where we try to avoid this. My favorite guy ever in the history of AA. There's a guy, a guy working in central office, Alcoholics Anonymous, the phone rings, picks up the phone and says, Alcoholics Anonymous, can I help you? And a woman says, uh, y yes, my name is uh, Louise, and uh, I'd like to know how long your waiting list is. And the guy in the central office goes, what are you talking about? What are you talking? He goes, well, my husband, Harry, is an alcoholic, and I have told Harry, if you continue to drink the way that you are drinking, I am leaving you, and I want you to go to Alcoholics Anonymous immediately. I came home this afternoon, and Harry said to me, honey, I have called Alcoholics Anonymous, but they're full. <laughs> However, I am on the waiting list, and I'll let you know as soon as there's an opening. <laughs> so she was calling to find out, and I tell that story every once in a while in the country, hoping someday a hand's going to go up somewhere, and Harry's going to go, right here. I was <laughs> Glad to see we made room for you, Harry. <laughs> so, what, I, I gotta know, so as a newcomer, I had to find out just give me the basics. Give it to me real simple. Give me the basics. Don't offer me too many ways of looking at it. Just give me Earl go meeting, go home, you know? <laughs> Get it really simple because there's already way too much going on in here, you know? I mean, it's just crazy, the thoughts that roll through my head nonstop, and it doesn't take anything to trigger them. Just, you know, something shiny in the corner of my eye. You know, just, <gasps> you know, and I... <laughs> you know what I mean? I, my attention span is limited. And, as an, I, and so I got to keep it simple. I have to know, like, what am I doing here? Why here? Why this? Why me? What's, what's the basic of that as a new guy? For me, it's this. I'm not here to stop drinking. I, I, stop, I can stop drinking every two, three hours. You know what I mean? I can't tell you how many times I was out there, and as my head was heading for the table, I would say, this has got to stop. <laughs> but every time my head would come back up off the table, I had a whole new agenda. You know, my God, if I'm not mistaken, I just had a feeling. <laughs> I, I got a drink. <laughs> All right. Get that to go away. <laughs> you know. So, uh, so I can stop drinking. I'm great at that. Want to stop? Let's, you want to stop? Let's stop drinking right now. I can do it. But the th th that's not the, the goal here for me. The goal here is not to stop drinking. The goal here is how do I not start again? How do I not start again? That's the trick for me. I always start again. How do I not start again? And the only way I've found for me to not start again is I've got to get comfortable sober. I've got to find a way to get comfortable sober. And the only way I can get comfortable sober is to be relieved of the obsessive nature of my mind, my thinking as it relates to my alcoholism, that, that the persistence of this illusion, this belief in a lie that I can drink like a normal man is astonishing. Many of us pursue it to the gates of insanity and death. I talked about that last night. That, that's the thing that I have to focus on for myself as a newcomer is that I want to learn how to stay stopped. I want to find the tools that make it possible for me to be comfortable sober because I am not. With the obsession of the mind in full effect, having kicked alcohol and drugs, I, which as, as, as a practicing alcoholic, right, I'm out there drinking and using. The thing that I fear the most is the kick, the detox. I think I've avoided, I've, I drank for two years just to avoid it. Not because I was having any fun drinking, but just that I was convinced, however bad it was out there drinking and using, detoxing was worse, right? So I end up and I detox. Now, it's my nature... When, after I've detoxed, I think, well, things have improved tremendously. And that's the, I notice that going into treatment centers and talking. I ask them a question. They'll be sitting in there, they're in treatment, and I'll say, okay, how many people in this treatment facility have been in here over a week? And, you know, like two-thirds of the hands will go up. I go, out of that group, how many of you have, while you've been here, awakened one morning and thought without any concern about the thought, 
you know, I believe I've overreacted. (laughs) I feel great. I feel much better. Getting a little sleep again, you know, able to hold down food, body functions are returning to normal. I'm on the mend. I feel good. Holding the hand up, it's barely shaking at all. I'm doing fantastic, right? As a matter of fact, that guy told me his name was Fred yesterday, and I remember it today. I'm good to go, (laughs) right? And off they go. They leave treatment and go out there. Thinking, like that nurse told me in that bootleg deep sanitarium there in Hollywood in 1978. She said, now armed with this self-knowledge that you're an alcoholic, you go out there and don't drink anymore no matter what, Earl. I said, yes, ma'am. I knew. I, I had the information. And I went out and drank for two more years. Because as, as, as Don spoke very well to, he, to this point, it's not what I know that will keep me sober. It's what I do. It's, it's the actions that are, bring about change. Action brings about change. Thinking brings about thinking. I've thought about that. And now, and now I'm going to think about it some more. Where are you going? I'm going to my room to think about what's been said here. No. Don't do it. <laughs> You know, and as to the self-help stuff, I couldn't agree with Don Moore. I think uh, the guys that I sponsor, you don't get to kill yourself without calling me first. You don't get to leave town without calling me first. You don't get to drink or use without calling me first. And by all means, when you go to the bookstore, you are at all costs to avoid the self-help section. <laughs> Do not go in the self-help section. There's, a <laughs> There's this woman I dated in AA, fantastic human being. One of the most hellacious alcoholic drug addicts I've ever known in my life. This is a woman that could only stay sober, basically incarcerated. You know, if you locked her up, she'd stay sober. She'd come out and go to A. She'd been in AA as long as me. I think right now she's got maybe a couple of weeks. Um, uh, 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 An amazing, beautiful, bright, hellacious alcoholic and drug addict. And I remember I got a call from her one day, and uh, she said, Earl, how you doing? I said, good, 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 good to hear from you. How you doing? She said, oh, I'm up in Santa Barbara, you know. And I said, what are you doing? She goes, well, I'm, you know, I've been a call girl for a while. I said, well, good for you. And, <laughs> and she said, however, I've gotten married, and I'm flying back into L.A., and my husband travels a lot, and, and uh, he's out of town. I was wondering if you'd pick me up at the airport. And I said, sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I like that. Now, I work a better program than that. <laughs> so she came into town, and, and, I, and, and I picked her up and got her bags and got her in the car, and we're driving to her husband's house, and we're talking. And she looks fantastic, right? I said, you look great. It's great to see you. You know, you're married. This is great, you know? And uh, um, <laughs> we go to this guy's house, and then we, she opens the door, and we go in and put her books down. And I look around, and this man has every book, magazine, pamphlet, cassette, DVD, CD on self-help that has ever been known to man in this house. It is everywhere. There's books. I mean, men who love the women longer than the thing with the who and the where. I mean, it's, it's just everywhere, you know? stacks of magazines on the tables and, you know, and all this. And I'm looking around and I look up at her and I said, does he know this isn't going to be enough? (laughs) He can read all the self-help books he wants. He married a practicing alcoholic. Good luck with that. So the self-help stuff, no. This, uh, no thinking about this. Got to take action. Action brings about change. I am looking for change. I'm a self-centered, frightened alcoholic. I need to take actions that are contrary to those that I've been taking. If I don't like what I'm getting, I need to stop doing what I'm doing that's getting me that. It's real simple. I need to move in a different direction. As a, as a guy like me who comes here destroyed, I, if I could articulate it when I knew, I would have said to my sponsor that I got only because... They said, get one. All right, that guy, he's insane. And I get it. I got, I got a vicious sponsor. I didn't know it. 
God shot for me that I picked the one I picked because my picker was broken. I said, well, that guy, I love that guy. Why? Well, he's nuts. That guy's the only guy I've ever met. Been in the nut house 23 times. Only guy I've ever met has been evicted from the nut house. <laughs> they told the late great Donald Madden, get out. You Go. You can't stay here any longer. You've got to go leave now or you're going to be one of the ones that never leaves. And they spit him out into AA and he was waiting there for me when I showed up. And, and I, they said, what, Donald, I, don't, I would have said to Donald... I'd love to suggest to you what, you know, to you, you know, I hear I'm going to take this contrary action over here, but I'm so stuck in what I've always done, I don't know what a contrary action is. I don't know which direction to go, which was terrific. What that meant was that there was some semblance of humility going on in me. Humility being the willingness to learn. That's all it was, was the willingness to learn. Having been beaten into a state of reasonableness by my alcoholism, which is what the book suggests, what made me willing to say, hey, have you got any ideas, was the immediate terror of my life, the result of my actions, that, that place where you come in here and your head's on fire, you know, and, and standing there with your head on fire, and a guy in the program walks up and says, how you doing? <laughs> and you're in flames. <laughs> and he's asking just because he wants to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> hey, look, this should be fun. There's one that's still on fire. <laughs> how are you doing? And I look at him and go, fine. Have you got a fire extinguisher or a blanket or something? Because I'm <laughs> just fine. The newcomer mantra. How you doing? Fine. How are you? Good. You all right? Great. What are you thinking about? I don't know. What's going on? I have no idea. Why are you asking me these questions? <laughs> Sorry. Calm down. Who's going to walk Earl today? <laughs> just walk Earl. <laughs> oh, I should say it's a testimony to the human skull, how strong the human skull is, the kind of pressure we walk around in, you know, when we're new. I mean, we should be sitting around in meetings like this, and occasionally some guy's head should just explode. Just boom. And slump over on the floor, and we have a special cleanup committee, the new, Newcomer Explosion Committee, you know what I mean? And they run over and clean it up. And the newcomers in the front are going, what's going on? What's going on? Never mind. The meeting's up front. Look up front. You could be next. Because <laughs> it's just pandemonium in there, which is why it's so beautiful that the program is such a simple thing. It is a program of action, how it works. Don talked about go to the text, go to the text, and it will tell you precisely what to do, that there's an order to this. There is a rhyme. There is a reason. There is a rhythm to this, right? And what we get in here is we've got to try to get into that rhythm and get that sobriety groove going. It's what's so great about this is, as Don alluded to, you don't have to be good at it. You don't have to get it right. You just have to be willing. Right, And what you need to be willing to do is you need to be willing to take actions that make no sense, and you need to be willing to be bad at it. Right? Which is, and that's a big one for somebody like me. I mean, I like, I like the way Eddie Van Halen plays the guitar. And I will listen to Eddie Van Halen play the guitar and I, as an untreated alcoholic, and I will think, now that is playing the guitar. I shall play the guitar like Eddie Van Halen. Because I identify, I get it. This will be easy. I go and I buy the very guitar that Eddie Van Halen plays. The same amp, the pick, the strings. I get all the equipment. I get the book of Eddie Van Halen songs. And I put it out and I turn on the amp and the guitar and we got, we're all tuned up and we're ready to go. And I take the pick holding it precisely as Eddie Van Halen holds it. And I begin to play. Oddly, this does not sound like Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> and after 20 minutes of the horror that I am creating on this guitar, I put it down having spent $2,500, thinking to myself, I hate the guitar. And off I go. If I can't be great at it right off the bat now, Eddie Van Halen plays the way he plays because when I was out 13, 14, 15 years old, smoking weed, drinking, shooting dope, doing all that, you know, chasing girls, Eddie was in his 
room doing scales and doing scales and practicing and investing in and participating in and on the path and in doing all the things that I'm unwilling to do. I'm either going to be great immediately or I don't want to play. So I've got to be willing to be bad at something and go through the process of discovery that takes place in the learning process of becoming somewhat comfortable within, in this case, recovery. I've got to know why I'm... Because I went to meetings because the guy who was sober said we go to meetings. I didn't ask, well, well why do we go to meetings? Luckily, I just went because I was told by somebody who had what I wanted, a guy who was comfortable sober said, go to meetings. So I went to meetings. And in going to meetings, I heard other things, because there were other sober alcoholics standing around in varying stages of recovery. And I would key off my sponsor. I remember, I would ever, because I was afraid of everyone. So we would go to a meeting, and my sponsor would say, uh, this is Al S., Al Signs. Listen to him. I go, oh, got it. Phaser shields down. And Al would let it rip, and I would just let it hit me in the face. And he, what would you think, Al? Didn't understand a word he said. <laughs> but you were listening? Yes, sir. Good enough. I think, oh, good, good. <laughs> you know, go home and go to the next meeting. And we go, and there was this woman. <laughs> this woman shows up at a meeting one day, and she's got, maybe one, she said, she started, and Donald's going, I go, he hadn't seen her in like five years. And I'm sitting next to Donald, and he goes, good, and he goes, wonderful. So she gets up at the podium and she says, uh, I figured it all out. And she slaps on the front of the podium this fold-out page, that's this big giant page that's color-coded. And what she's figured out is how all the human emotions factor into alcoholism. And she has a chart that you read your book and follow the chart. And I, I went, huh? And I, lo- and I looked at Donald and Don- I saw Donald just go like this. And I went, phaser shield up! (laughs) I ain't listening to that. I'm way too unstable to get into that, right? (laughs) You know, next time somebody asks me how I feel, I'll say, I'm happy, sad, connected to page 47, and it goes on, as also evidenced by page 93. What does that mean? I don't know! No. It's like uh, there were some guys I was uh, 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 that were running around in my neck of the woods. They were sponsoring everybody. They were all like three and four years sober, and they were just had gone insane in AA. And they were sponsoring everybody. And they came up to me one day and said, "Earl, we've torn page 449 out of all our guys' books." I said, "Really?" You know, me being a Paul, Doctor Paul being a hero of mine, and that's one of the pages in his story. I went, "Really." Torn page 449 of the book. Yeah, this acceptance thing, bad idea. Tore it out of the book. What do you think of that? And I said, well, I can't thank you enough. For, at this point, for probably 75 years now, um, we've been at terrible risk and did not know it. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that you two have come along just in time (laughs) to save us from ourselves. And I just went on and on and on, and they finally, they got it. like, okay, we get it. Staple 449 back in the books, right? (laughs) Yeah, why don't you do that? I said, look, 449, you don't go, it says, nobody's ever said, okay, I'm new and I've got this book, what should I do? Go directly to page 449. No. How about there's 448 pages before that? And if you do all that in order, by the time you get there, oddly enough, that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Having worked all 12 steps as outlined in the program, having done this stuff, having gone to the wives afterward, having gone to the family afterward. By the way, the family afterward for me is this. This is the family afterward for me. This is my family. I have a greater sense of family in this than I've ever had in my life. B- including the blood. This has been the connection for me. This is where I've found life. If you're new, it's about keeping it simple. It's about being a... 
the reason I go to meetings, it, meetings are a place where a newcomer can come and hear a message of hope and recovery. That's what they're for. They're for you. They were for me when I came in. The guys who had worked the 12 steps had been relieved of the obsession of the mind, the point of the steps, had been, were now walking the earth free men, were a comfortable sober. There were guys that were comfortable sober, and the only place I could find them was in AA meetings. So I went to AA meetings, and I looked for those guys that were comfortable sober. And I asked them, how did you get that? And they said, well, I did this. I got this book. And I did this, and I worked through the steps as outlined in this book. Very simple. And then when I became comfortable sober, I no longer came to meetings to take. I came to give back what had freely been given to me. And I come here, and I share my experience, strength, and hope. Like a couple of guys came up to me uh, during the break, and they were saying, you know, it's, it's, they, they were saying to me, we, we think it's remarkable that you get on planes with your experience, with your absolute terror of flying, and that you come to these things. And I said, you know, for me, that's the nice thing about what happens here. This goes so far past not drinking and using, it's unbelievable. What happens in here is that there is a new freedom and a new happiness. And a part of that new freedom for me is the power of choice has been returned. I can choose. I can choose how I approach things. Now, I can, every time I get on a plane, I can recognize that for me what I have to do is face my own death. I have to, I have, that, that's just what works. I go, okay, this, I, I know how this could go, but I'm going to go do it anyway, right? And surrender to that feeling. But what immediately follows that is, okay, now that I've done that, now I'm on this plane, I can choose to, to, that this great gift of being on an airplane for me, the gift of the flight part of it for me is, is that I'm one of the guys that really gets to know on a regular basis that I'm willing to go to any lengths. Because I get on a plane. All I got to do to know if I'm willing to go to any lengths is get on a plane. That's all I got to do. And AA keeps, is constantly, God is constantly giving me that opportunity to remember, to remember. Now, on occasion, I do draw the line. I was asked to speak in a place called Polesbo, Washington, in Washington State. And the girl calls me up and says, we've listened to your tape. We love you. We want you to come. We're just going to fly you straight up into Seattle. Then we're going to put you on the puddle jumper and fly you. And I went, hold it. What's the puddle jumper? <laughs> And she said, well, it's Kenmore Airlines. And I said, they make washing machines. <laughs> I said, I will be happy to fly to Seattle, but if you'll just tell me how far a drive it is, I'll be happy to rent a car at my expense and drive from Seattle to Polesbo because really got to pass on the flying washing machine. <laughs> That's pushing it too far for me. <laughs> so I'm willing to go to any lengths short of Kenmore. <laughs> I still got that to go. Who knows? Maybe. When I was new, I used to think, well, what I need to do is parachute out of an airplane. That'll help. And my sponsor, when he was through laughing, <laughs> said, love the things that come out of your head. Couldn't be less useful. <laughs> And I, what do you mean by, right? I mean, it was just the best. I mean, and having a sponsor, getting the guy in the meeting, go to a meeting, go to a regular meeting regularly. Because you can remain anonymous in AA, and we don't want to do that. Point well taken, Don. No need to be anonymous here, according to those guys. Or old Hightower, you know? You want to be able to find each other. Check up on each other. See how the other man is doing. Got to get to actually know each other in here. And if you're new, that's a terrifying thought. But trust me, you're not the first desperate, terrified, isolated, homicidal, suicidal, flashing, victim, assassin, victim, assassin. You know, we're all like that. We didn't come get here looking like this. Remember that a process has taken place with us. You're just taking your turn, and that's all we're asking, is that you take your turn. Take your turn. If, if I'll tell you the truth about me. When I came here and you asked me how I was doing, I said, fine. The truth is this. If, you had, if I had been honest when I was new, if you came up to me and said, how are you doing, I would have just started screaming. <laughs> how are you doing? Ah! <laughs> well, well, good for you. All right. 
No coffee for him. Get him a seat. <laughs> right? That's the truth. What's going on? I don't know. How are you? Don't have a clue. That's the truth. There's a guy said to me, talk about what it's like to be new, what you were like new going to a meeting. And it's a pretty simple story, you know. I had found Ohio Street, and it was this, like, yellowish building that really stood out, so it was easy to spot. This was helpful for me. You know, look for the, oh, there it is. <laughs> it just kind of glared at you, you know. And it was me, and I would drive to the meeting, and I would drive to the meeting. Going to the meeting, good, 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 good. Going to the meeting, going to the meeting, going to the meeting. There it is, there it is, there it is. Good, 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 good. All right, pull in the parking lot, pull in the parking lot, pull in the parking lot. Pull far, pull, park far away, so if you have to run for it, you can run for it, and you can get the car out, and you can go. Park way over there, or park way over there. Go into the meeting, go into the meeting. Got to get a seat. They put the keys on the seat. They put the keys on the seat. Find the seat, put the key on the seat. Where am I going to sit? I'll sit next to the guy with the red coat. Sit next to the guy with the red coat. You find the guy with the red coat, you find your seat, you got your keys. Good, 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 good. How you doing? Fine. How you doing? Fine. <laughs> Sitting in the seat, sitting in the seat, good, good, good. I'm at an A meeting, good, 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 good. good, good, good. Start to me, 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 start to me. And all the time I'm looking like every other guy in the man, yeah, you know, I'm fitting right in, but just <laughs> crazy. I mean, you're just so scared because you, know, you know. Guy got up, the guy got up, he talked, he's down. I don't know anything that guy said. I don't know what that. Here's another guy got up, he, he rarely saw something. He rarely saw something. I don't know what he really saw, but he rarely saw something. He saw something. He really saw something. 12 things, 12 things, 12 things in AA, 12 things in AA. That was good. I don't really know what those were, but those were good. Those were good. 12 things, 12 things. 12 things, ABC, 12 things, ABC. He's down. I didn't get a lot of that. 12 things, ABC, 12 things, ABC. Here's another guy got up. He drank, he drank. I drank like that. I drank like that. I love this guy. I love that guy. That is a great guy. He's down. Didn't get a lot. Love them. Love them. He's down. They're passing a basket. Why are they passing a basket? Passing a basket. Oh, don't take the money. Don't take the money. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. Didn't take the money. Didn't take the money. Okay, they're, they're all up. We're up. What are we doing? We're doing. We're going outside. We're smoking. I smoke. I smoke. We'll smoke. How you doing? Fine. How you doing? Fine. How you doing? I'm fine. They're ringing a bell, they're ringing a bell, we're going in, we're going in, we're going in, we're going in, we're going in. Okay, find the guy. Red coat, red coat, where's the guy with the red coat? Red coat, right here. How you doing? Fine, fine, man. Hey, back off. All right, I got... I'm in the seat, I'm in the seat, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Another guy's reading 12 things. Those are not the same 12 things. 24 things ABC. 24 things ABC. He's down. Didn't get a lot of that either. Here's another guy. I drank like that. I drank like that. Hell with that other guy. This guy's amazing. <laughs> I love that guy. I love that guy. I drank like that. I drank like that. Unbelievable. I felt like that. I felt like that. That's how I feel. How does that guy know how I feel? That guy's reading my mail. It's like I have no, there's no defense against you people. You're just in. You know what's going on. I can't, this is the strangest feeling. What is this feeling? I don't know what this feeling is. What is this feeling? This is creepy. I, you know, you're like voodoo people. What is going on? He's down. I'm not so sure I want to talk to that guy. That was way too close, man. That was way too close. We're up. They've got me. We're saying a prayer. I know this prayer. Lord, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Walk out. And guys would say to me, how was the meeting? It's great. And I'd go home. I'd cry all the way home in my car. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> What are these people doing? I don't understand. <laughs> and I would just pace in my little room. It was like really the size of a cell. And I would just pace in my little room, get my hours sleep, get up, go to work, and I would go back to one of those meetings and just go, all right, let's try it again. <laughs> now, that, you think of that guy and you think, that guy doesn't have a chance. That guy's not getting it. He can't even track information. He's so busy thinking about his stuff, him, his perception, how he's feeling, how this is affecting him. He can't get out of himself. That guy's doomed. There's no way that guy is ever going to be able to consistently take contrary action long enough to enter into what would even remotely resemble the state of grace that I consider recovery to be. There's no way that guy's getting there. And here I am, 25 years later, and I've never left you. And that's how I started, so crippled, so incapable of 
love towards self or others, or tolerance towards self or others, on any level, forget having it as a code of how I live my life. Forget. And in 25 years, all the way through, it's gotten closer. When I turned five years sober and had my first AA birthday party at the late Stephen Arrow's house, and we had a party for my five years, I got the nickel, man. It wasn't, it was like, <clears throat> I got five, right? And I was so excited, and I knew people, and people were coming to a party for me to celebrate that I was sober that they cared about me, and this horrible thing had happened along the way, they actually knew who I was. They'd removed the, the cocoon somehow. AA had picked my pocket like a thief in the night somewhere along the way, and the line between self and other had been blurred, and connection of, of a meaningful purposeful level had occurred and I didn't know when or how that had happened I remember calling Donald Madden up one day and saying my sponsor and saying something terribly wrong has gone on I was three years over he said what is it and I said I love you and he said oh I know <laughs> click <laughs> why well, I ruined the moment with a lot of chatter He was, was so good about that stuff. But, I mean, it, I guess what I'm trying to say to you guys is, is that if I go to regular meetings regularly, I get a sponsor. I work the steps as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with that sponsor. Things are going to happen regardless of what's going on in your head. You will heal. You will heal. And you will heal precisely in the areas where it is necessary that you heal. You will heal these areas in precisely the order in which you need to heal. It's what happens here. It's, it's like going to the gym. You go to the gym. You can get, See, what's great about this is it doesn't matter what you think. You don't have to think this is a good idea. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it, and it will work. I had no ability to comprehend what was afoot here when I came here. I didn't have the ability to, let alone the incl you know, an inclination to do something other than what was going on in my head. You don't have to like it. You don't have to think it's a good idea. You just have to do it. It looks like going to the gym. You can go to a gym. A gym is a place where they have, there are lots of very heavy things laying around. That's what a gym is. And you can go in there and go, this is ridiculous. This will never work. I hate it. As you are picking up heavy things, what you ha and what you do in the gym is you pick the heavy thing up, then you put it back down again. And repeat. That's <laughs> all the gym is. So you're in there and you're picking up heavy things and putting them down again. You think, this is stupid. I hate it. It'll never work. You go in there every day for six weeks, what happens? Get stronger. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't <laughs> matter how you feel about it. If you do it, it works. This is the same thing. If you go to regular meetings regularly, my favorite share ever in a meeting was a guy named Bob. Went to a noon meeting. I had an easy day going, slid into a noon meeting. I'd never been there. I'd heard about it, slid in. guy I knew was leading the meeting. And it was one of those meetings where participation meetings where you don't raise your hand. The guy goes, you, share, you, you. Just calling on people, right? So you're at risk the whole time you're in there, all right? <laughs> so you're sitting in there kind of, you know, and every time, so you thank somebody for sharing, you, you know. And I said, and how often I hear him say, uh, Bob, you want to share? It? And Bob says, sure. Bob, alcoholic. Hate AA. Hate the steps. Hate this meeting. You over there. Particularly hate you. Hate you. <laughs> hate everything about this damn program. Everything in it. Everybody in it. Every second I have been in this miserable organization. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs> half the room's like, oh my God. The other half, including me, are like, all right, Bob. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Right? Because the fact is, Bob felt like that at home. Bob got his hostile ass up off of that couch, into a car, 
drove it to the meeting, was sitting there being completely respectful of the podium, the leader, the people that were sharing. And when called upon to share, Bob saw that as an AA request. <laughs> and Bob shared honestly with the group and then shut up. Bob's fine. I love that meeting. Bob makes the coffee there now. Bob, how you doing, Bob? Great. Right? Bob doesn't ask you how you're doing because Bob doesn't really care yet. But <laughs> but he's doing great, man. I mean, it's like that. It's not, you know. You know, I walked the 12 golden steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've been a, I've never had a bad day since. There are guys that profess that. I say, God bless them. That's terrific. Sounds more like a psychotic break to me. <laughs> because me, you know, it's life on life terms. I hear things all the time I don't want to hear, like, no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, are you still here? Right? I get discounted, people lie to me, people betray me, I, I make great plans that just catch on fire and burn to the ground. All, you know, it's life. I have a wife that I love dearly and loves me, and on occasion, oddly, shockingly, we're not on the same page. <laughs> she will walk in and say things to me, and I will think, where have you been? What? English. I need that in English. I have no idea what you're talking about. And she looks at me like I'm an idiot. I mean, and I've learned one of the things, my, my wife will come to me and I'll, and I'll go home and she'll be in this terrible state. This is, again, a gift of AA. Sounds like it has nothing to do with recovery, but it has everything to do with it. My wife, I walk in the room and my wife says, uh, she's obviously upset. And I go, honey, what's wrong? And she says, well, this, 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 and this. And I think, this is fantastic. I am listening. I can't tell you how many term, times I have heard you're not listening. I'm listening now, and I am on this one. I have heard what the problem is, and I have a solution. And I am now going to give her the gift of this solution <laughs> to her problem. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And she's going to immediately recognize, one, that I clearly love her madly, that her problems are my problems, that I am here for her, I am listening I am problem solving and we are going to work this through this as a couple, <laughs> through this problem to, to her delight. I mean, I'm golden on so many levels here, I can't believe it. <laughs> I then lay this gem on her and she looks at me and goes, idiot, and walks out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I have since learned what you do in this situation is you listen carefully. And as soon as she's done, and you ask, by the way, is that it? Because if you step in too early, not good. Step back out. Is that, that's, that's everything? Yeah. And I go over, and I give her a hug, and I tell her I love her. And that there's, if she needs my, or wants my help in any way, I'm there for her. All she's got to do is ask. And then I quietly, slowly back <laughs> out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like AA. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's being in the company of sane men. It's being in the company of men who remember what day it is, who have an actual history. I didn't have a history with anyone or anything when I got here. I have it now because we've all been awake and conscious together through a process of life. That's what you get here. The book says that this is a book that describes how we, precisely how we have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I came in here seemingly hopeless, and obviously, but obviously not. Still here, still here, still sober, comfortable sober, reveling in the path. If you're new, it's footwork. It's just one foot in front of the other. It's chop the wood and carry the water of AA. Just go to a meeting. When's a good time to go to a meeting? When you want to go and when you don't want to go. Those are both great times to go to meetings. So you go to a regular meetings regularly, get a sponsor to work the steps with you. When you have the awakening that step 12 suggests that we have as a direct result 
of working these steps. Restore to sanity, soundness of mind, relieved of the obsession to drink and use. Walk in the earth a free man. I can now be of service. The third side of the triangle. Unity is the body. I bring it here. Recoveries of the mind to get relieved of the greater aspect of my illness, the obsession of the mind. I work the 12 steps. Having had an awakening as a result of that, I can come to meetings now and be of service. The biggest buzz I have ever known. I mean, it's a great thing to get three of the beast, man. It's huge for a slave to alcohol and drugs like me. To get free of that beast is an amazing experience that the steps gives me. To find that the cocoon gets removed and I can be in the company of my fellows and my God that I can be connected again instead of separated from is an amazing feeling. Absolutely amazing feeling. But to be able to sit down with a new guy to have a guy walk in and say, I can't stop drinking. I'm afraid I'm going to drink tonight. You got any ideas? To be able to say to that man, yes, I do. First and foremost, I must tell you, though, the great news here is none of the stuff I'm going to share with you has anything to do with as Earl sees it. <laughs> None of this is my best thinking. None of this stuff from my ideas. This is the stuff that comes from the original 100. The guys who got clean and sober at a time when it was not hip or fashionable or even acceptable to acknowledge alcoholism and get sober. This, these were guys, and if you read the forewords to the book, these were guys, 75% of them came to no long-term sobriety. It actually goes beyond that. But just for the sake of the conversation, we'll say 75% of them came to no long-term sobriety. And a lot of others were, were sober periodically, and their lives improved substantially as a result of doing what was in that book. That's far better than anything I'm seeing going on. And I think it's a remarkable, remarkable thing that that's available today, not having been changed or messed with. There it is. I can use it, and it's as applicable today in my 21st century life as it was then. It's an amazing deal. So if you're new, congratulations. This is beyond anything you could imagine. That's the nature of it. And that's true for every single one of us that comes in. Nobody comes into AA, embraces the spiritual path, and instantly goes, oh, I understand, and that there is no pop of consciousness from that point on. Our consciousness gets popped all the way along. No matter where we are, there's more. No matter what you know, perceive, understand, there's more. That's been my experience for 25 years. No matter how deeply or profoundly I may grasp a concept or an idea or an action or a notion that's available in here, if I keep coming and just doing the same things I did when I was new, going to regular meetings regularly, which is what I do, be sponsored, which is, and I am sponsored, Working the 12 steps, always, because I'm always working with, I'm sponsoring people. And when they go through the first step, I'm going through the first step with them. When they go through the fourth step, I'm going through the fourth step with them. When they do their, their ninth step, I'm riding along with them. I'm sitting in the car when they go up and knock on the door. You know, I always tell them to leave the keys in the car. Because <laughs> I need to blast on out of there, I can. <laughs> I'm always, that's what I do. And it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. There's worlds within worlds here. This is going as deep as you want to go. That's the beautiful thing about this. You're not going to run out of buzz. It's the exact opposite of drinking and using. Drinking and using, the best buzz I ever got was right up front. Right? I chased the tail of that dragon for 16 years on a daily basis. Right? And slowly over time, the buzz I got got less and less and less and less, and the price I paid for it got higher and higher and higher and higher. So in the end of my drinking and using, I'm paying an horrific price just to get to zero, to the absence of pain. I'm not getting high anymore. I haven't gotten high in years. In here, it's the exact opposite. You pay up front. You pay up front. You pay a hell of a price to come sit in here as a newcomer and get that little itty-bitty baby, tiny baby buzz. Right? But the longer you stay, the price you pay to be here gets less and less and less, and the buzz you get gets greater and greater and greater and greater. What, that's good news for a guy like me. That means all i got to do is what I did in the beginning today, and the buzz I get from it will be greater than it's ever been. If I can get between those. i got to be in the moment, which is the gift of recovery. 
right? In my life, in this moment, connected to you, connected to God. Some sense of being right-sized. Don talked about, you know, we're egomaniacs with inferiority complexes. Absolutely correct. What this process does is slowly bring those two aspects of self closer and closer together so that I can become right-sized, I can become centered. I can have purpose and value in my life that extends far beyond my miserable self. It's out into the world, purpose and value. That's a, that's a hell of a gift. And all i got to do, work the steps, go to meetings, get a sponsor, work the steps, and give it back away. That's all i got to do. All i got to do. The end. 